Welcome to the podcast, My Digital Pathology Trailblazers. Today, I have a special guest from Pakistan, Dr. Talat Zera. She is one of the finalists of the Pathology Power List this year. She also won the Pathology Vision Travel Awards in 2021. And recently, she published a paper with Dr. Anil Parwani about digital pathology in under-researched areas. Learn about the newest digital pathology trends in science and industry, meet the most interesting people in the niche, and gain insights relevant to your own projects. Here is where pathology meets computer science. You are listening to the Digital Pathology Podcast with your host, Dr. Alexandra Zhurov. Welcome to the podcast, Talat. How are you doing today? I'm doing well. How are you? I'm great. And I'm so happy that you joined me today. And we always start with the guests. So tell me about you. I'm Dr. Talat Zera. I am an assistant professor at Chinnah Medical University, Karachi, Pakistan. So I am basically a medical doctor. And I did my fellowship in histopathology from College of Physicians and Surgeons, Pakistan. As far as my digital pathology background is concerned, in 2019, early 2019, when I passed my fellowship exam, I started uh, my lab practice in a lab uh, in the evening time, along with my job in the university, which I was doing since 2016. But at the start of 2020, when the COVID transformed into pandemic, and we learn new norms of life, obviously. Due to this pandemic, many physical activities got stuck. My university got stopped and I started uh, teaching virtually. So, but one thing I was missing, that was my pathology learning. I left my job, my private job, which I was doing because I don't not, did not want uh, unnecessary exposure. So I left the job. So it was a time when I started missing that how, what are the tools through which I can continue my pathology journey as well. So at that time, I joined Digital Pathology Association, DPA, in uh, early 2020 in the Mm -hmm. organization. And I also read different papers and tools I came to know through which we can work virtually even without going to the lab. So these things were really amazing and I was really amazed by them how new digital tools I came to know about uh, whole slide imaging, computational pathology, deep learning model. So uh, I first I conducted a survey, a nationwide survey among the pathologists working in Pakistan to highlight uh, the digital pathology and create awareness among the pathologists working in Pakistan. This was the first survey. It was also published in one of the blogs of the DPA as well as in the form of original article as well in a peer review journal. And we can link to all the papers that we're mentioning in the show notes. So it's all going to be there for everyone who wants to have a look at the original source of information. Thank you. So uh, after learning these tools, uh, I had the bottleneck actually that we had not the scanner in our vicinity. So when I resumed my duty to my university in the mid of 2020, so I had a microscope which had a camera and it was an inbuilt camera and was connected with a screen. So I started my journey with this uh, uh, available tools. I used to take images, uh, static images. I, initially, I used to make a movie of that entire image and I used to send it to my colleagues for second opinion, telepathology. I used to do it and I, I and it was really amazing for me. I use it to, for the education, both for the undergraduate students of medicine as well as postgraduate students. So oh, I was enjoying it. But one thing was missing. That was the use of AI or the deep learning model uh, on these static images. So I approached uh, many software uh, vendors internationally, but when they came to know that I don't have a scanner, so they refused me because they, they don't know. They had no idea that AI can be applied on digital images. So, but I did not lose hope. Uh, I, I kept uh, contacting different vendors and one day I found a vendor, Iphoria. Uh, Iphoria, despite they know that I don't have a scanner, I don't have the whole slide images. They gave me their demo version for about one and a half months. And uh, to me, it was a really exciting moment because uh, I really wanted to use the AI tools, how they work on it, uh, on the digital images or the whole slide images. So uh, I'm really thankful to Dr. Darshan Kumar, who was the customer success manager of Iphoria. Uh, initially, I had no knowledge how to annotate the image, how to make algori- apply algorithms, how to test and train. I was completely zero. But uh, that gentleman helped me out and he, he taught me 
how to do how to how to annotate perfectly how to apply an algorithm and test and train the images so i did three projects in the in that three and a half month period or all, all these projects are now published in the peer review journals along with this ai learning i kept on writing different platforms international platforms highlighting the issues of delayed adoption of digital pathology in developing part of the world in 2021 when there was a path vision which is an annual conference of dpa first time probably they uh, put an award a travel award for develop for an individual from developing country i just filled the form it was written that the award will be given to those who have a knowledge of digital pathology computational pathology it will be given on the base of the knowledge of the individual so i just filled the form uh, keeping in mind that <laughs> it's a single award for a, for the entire developing world so i might get or may not so i forgot after uh, <laughs> submitting the application simply <laughs> because i i knew that i won't get but to me it was really a surprising event uh, thing when i got an email and i came to know that i am been i am the one who selected so though in 2021 i could not go to us at that time because mm-hmm. of some covid restrictions and visa issues but i'm highly thankful to dr anil pravani who brought my award all the way from us to karachi on his personal visit and he gave me that award in karachi uh, at a session organized by college of physician and surgeons of pakistan in his uh, honor he gave a fabulous talk there and it was the first talk about digital pathology and computational pathology in pakistan which was both attended physically as well as virtually all over the country and the response were high, was highly appreciated so i went to path vision 2022 actually so and i received the award once again <laughs> the same award and i got the travel grant as well so actually basically the uh, when i received when i got the, uh, one where i was selected for this award this was a really motivation for me then if you can work hard and if you are sincere in your efforts you can get the results so no need to be uh disheartened that you don't have a scanner so i kept working i did not stop my journey after that i worked with the uh, after working with iphoria uh mindpeak uh, another uh, uh, ai software they gave me their demo version and on simple digital images we worked on quantification of erpr and uh, and ki 67 after that uh, i worked with various computational pathologists group did different projects uh, similarly after that i did uh, i explored the open source software of uh, deep learning which are also available i worked with them and the results were really appreciating and uh, currently till uh, till date i have done more than 10 projects all the projects were done on digital images we applied ai and majority are published now so currently my focus is basically that how we can adopt digital pathology and computational pathology in resource limited setup a uh, developing world is contains the bulk of world population so bulk of world disease is there but less acute with diagnostic modalities particularly the novel ones so we need to work on these areas so that we can resolve our issues related to delayed adoption so i want i want to ask a quick question here because i want to dive deep into this but to take a step back You know, you use the phrase low resource country or low resource yeah. setting and you know, it's it's used all over. What does it mean? What does it yeah. mean a low resource setting? And yeah. by that I'm asking how does your daily pathology job look? Uh like you said you were working at the university and having a private practice. Yeah. Can you basically describe how does a career of a pathologist in Pakistan look? Yeah, sure. Uh, by low resource setting means in developing part of the world, most of the countries, the health structure is not very good in terms of uh, infrastructure, in terms of uh, logistics, in terms of manpower. We are deprived of number of healthcare professionals, both pathologists as well as the technol- technical staff. so we are in a resource limited setup we have bulk of diseases actually but less mm-hmm. acute with the diagnostic modalities or particularly the novel ones they are very rare unfortunately in developed part in developing part of the world as far as the um, pathology practice is concerned in pakistan pakistan is the fifth most populated country of the world population is more than 220 million people so if we talk about the number of cancer cases which are diagnosed every year according to who 
there are more than 200,000 new cases of cancer are diagnosed every year in Pakistan. And mm-hmm. this incidence is alarmingly increasing around the globe. You know, cancer cases are on, on the rise. But if we talk about the number of pathologists or the pathologists who are concerned with the diagnosis of cancer, their number is on declining trend around the globe. And the situation is more grave in our part of the world because there is a fast trend of going abroad by a skillful person who are working in the, in, in the developing world to get the good facilities of life. It's a very common trend. I am an example. I came, I, I'm from Poland and I work and live in the U.S. And yeah. when you look at the influential people in the digital pathology world, many of mm. them do not come from the U.S. even though they practice in the U.S. So totally can yeah. relate to that. Mm-hmm. So the situation becomes more grave actually. So oh. similarly, if you talk about the labs, the big labs who are equipped with good facility, I mean, they have good histopathology set up along with IHC facility, immunohistochemistry, and some of the labs have the molecular facility. These labs are also very smaller in number and you can count in your fingers. And mm-hmm. most of these big labs are situated in big country, big cities of the country against the bulk of the population who live in the rural areas. So at times, the patient's specimen, their blogs, and their slides, they have to travel a lot in search or, or finding their final diagnosis. And in this long journey, at times, the specimen may be lost or damaged. So all these things lead to increased morbidity and mortality of precious lives, actually, which could have been saved if diagnosed timely. So to me, digital pathology appears as a ray of hope in solving many of these issues. So another question. We have big labs that have access to molecular, to IHC, and can basically provide the final diagnosis, but they are only in the big cities. Yeah. And do you have histology in the small labs, or do you need to send the sample to the centralized lab? How does this journey of a sample look uh, yeah. in Pakistan. As I mentioned earlier, most of the big labs are situated in the big uh, cities of the country. Smaller labs usually uh, give the facility of h and only or the histology mm-hmm. examination. Then they refer it to the uh, bigger lab. Or sometimes the patient go take the sample and directly go to the bigger lab so just to avoid unnecessary time uh, issue. So mm-hmm. uh, this is an issue. And as you said, there, there is a there is, le- there is a poor health facility system present in most of the developing part of the world. So these issues uh, are still not uncommon in our part of the world. So you say you are working with a microscope with a microscope camera and most of your projects have been done on this type of, uh, of, of your images. What's your microscope? What's your camera? And how many of the microscopes are equipped with a camera yeah, currently, in Pakistan? Uh, most of the microscopes are equipped with the camera. Now, currently, the most of the okay. modern microscopes, uh, they give the facility of camera. So, uh, as I told you that there is shortage of pathologists, so we do telepathology through these camera connect. We take the images from the region of interest, take the pe- pho- pho- photograph through, even through the good uh, smartphone yeah, help us in the in our work. Yeah, so these are the these are the cheaper solutions uh, which can help. But obviously, if, if we have a small scanner facility uh, in some of the areas, that can make a difference. So that takes me to my next question, which is a little bit of like a devil advocate question, and I'm tell I'm gonna tell you why. Do you really need this scanner? How is it going to help? And, and why am I asking that? And, and um, you already mentioned a couple of components. So I always give this example. Okay, the only lower resource setting that I visited was uh, Ethiopia in Africa uh, mm-hmm. during a scholarship that I had. And I witnessed their pathology lab. And I don't think they had access to molecular. Maybe they did. But basically, in Africa in general, before telephone cables were installed, the world already moved to smartphones. So they basically skipped this whole thing, this part of technology development, they could enter in the next step. So everybody has a smartphone. I don't know what's the situation in Pakistan, if you guys are uh, users of smartphones, but it looks like you at least have a smartphone. Yeah, a majority of the health professionals have a smartphone. You want to sell this 
that basic infrastructure is still weak and you are talking about the scanner. Yeah, we have the issues. We have already the pre-existing issues which we need to solve. But beside this, we need to adopt the novel tools as well. Why I emphasize is that by adopting these more novel tools, we can resolve our pre-existing issues actually. For example, if we, I don't talk to, for, that we should have a high-tech scanner. I, I, I talk about the low, low slide scanner, smaller scanner or digital microscope. We don't need a big logistics actually. We have issue of reduced declining number of pathologists, right? As I mentioned mm -hmm. earlier. The number of pathologists in Pakistan are not more than 500. Okay. Against the bulk of population, which is 220 million people, more than 220 million people. So, as I mentioned earlier, the number of cancer cases is on the rise around the globe. The situation is more grave in our part of the world because we are we had the bulk of world population. So, in histopathology particularly, and the cancer cases, we need second and third opinion. We need um, opinion from the subject specialist. So, if we had that facility of a scanner, or the low, low slide scanner, we can send the images to uh, the concerned pathologists around the world on a single click. It will speed the diagnosis of the patient and also will re reduce the miseries of the patient. You know, we, we had to send the slides, slides have to travel from one place to another so that the pathologist can see. You know, sometimes you, you, I used to send the digital image to my senior colleague, but she says, no, I'm not um, satisfied. You, you, I want to see the whole image. Obviously, it's true because okay. the histopathology is very important field and we are dealing with the lives of the patient. So by adopting the novel tools, at least we can, we can reduce or we can uh, minimize our own issues, which we can resolve the, our already existing issues, which are already present in our part of the world. Similarly, once your data is digitized, so you have residents working in different parts of the country, they don't get the equal facilities of learning. Once you have a centralized data, you can share it to every resident. So in this way, you can provide equal opportunities of learning for all the residents working in the country, irrespective of their geographical status. Similarly, this is an era of precision medicine. The disease behave differently from region to the region. Once your data is digitized, you can make your own disease model disease trend and predict the disease outcome according to your own demographic region. In this way, opening the door of precision medicine. So that's why I emphasize that we need to adopt these tools to solve mm -hmm. our pre-existing issues, actually. Though we need to resolve them as well, obviously. But by adopting these, these tools can help, actually. See, yeah, I hear what you're saying. So basically, because my argument was like, Okay, you're a pathologist, you're seeking consultation with another pathologist, you know what to take the pictures of, you know which regions are diagnostic, where you have um, the problem, and you just send them static images. But the one thing that you said that you need to have a database representative of your own demographic, that's something um, that probably will require whole slate images, even if you don't necessarily need to use it routinely for telepathology, telemedicine, which you're already doing with your microscope cameras, right? Yeah. Actually, we need to start things gradually. We don't need to jump uh, on the primary diagnosis. We need to start working on the more common disease. For example, breast cancer. The, mm -hmm. the, the breast cancer is the most common cancer in the world. Also, the most common cancer in the women were in the in Pakistan as well. So uh, we should have our own data because it's, it's the most common tumor. I don't want that we should have uh, digitized data for every disease, but for the common diseases which needs treatment and the treatment and treatment can be different from region to other region, from one region to another region of the world. So at least for the common diseases, we can make our own data digitized. So question: Did you try any already developed? algorithms on other populations applied to your uh, images or whole slide images? Yeah, I, I took the demo version from MindPeak. Uh, and we already uh, com a commercially available software and I use it on the data of my population, Pakistani population. Similarly, I used uh, DeepLife, uh, an open mm -hmm. source software. And its results were really amazing. It was very pathologist friendly software. It has so many tools which can help the pathologist to make things more accurate. I checked this one as well, the deep life. It's so easy. You just drag and drop your image and you don't even have to have false light images. You can just have a screenshot. Yeah. 
I used to take images at 10x and I used to upload it and then I annotate the region of interest, sometimes exclude the region where I don't need. And we did a large validation study on KI67 quantification in breast cancer patients. We took a result from pathologists working in developing part of the world, 10 pathologists took part in that mm -hmm. study. And the result of this study were really amazing. And now it's in the process of publication. So we have used uh, basically AI-based software for validation study in our part of the world. So do you routinely use it or do you have the option to now start using it after you publish the data or after your validation is done? Well, it will take time. I, I believe that we need more validation study or more mm -hmm. scale. You know, when, when you are using digital images, obviously the size of that image is very small as compared to the whole slide image. So uh, uh, all the projects which I have done yet, that was on digital image. But now by the grace of Almighty, now we have started working on whole slide images after mm -hmm. doing lots of work on digital images. I have Currently, I'm doing two projects on host lighting. One of them was, is on breast and the other one I did on cutaneous leishmaniasis, a skin biopsy, a skin disease and endemic disease of developing part of the world. I did uh, this project and still it's also in the process of publication. Amazing. So how much proof or how much validation do you need to start deploying it? Which regulatory framework are you constrained by? And like, when would you be confident or allowed to start using what you've been developing for the last several years that you've been working on digital pathology? Yeah, my projects are, most of the projects are the pilot study, they're the proof of mm -hmm. concept studies. Obviously, large studies are still needed. As far as AI is concerned, you know, AI is a, basically a pathologist assisted tool. So it should be an assisted tool, not it should not replace the pathologist's decision. So in even in developed part of the world, there is not 100% adoption, digital adoption that was required, right? So AI tools are still not perfect. Pathologists are scared of the black black box, that who is going to control the momentum? It is the pathologist who is signing out the report or the one who is making the tools? So I believe that there is a lot of, still a lot of debate before applying AI tools in full flesh in the uh, clinical side. But obviously there are certain tools like uh, AI is way better than pathologists in terms of quantification, particularly, you know, where, when you talk about KI 67 quantification, particularly, there is too much, it's a, the subject of too much subjective uh, uh, variability. So AI tools can be helpful in this setup. Yani, I mean, it, it can reduce the subjective variability. These tools are more fast accurate and reproducible. So, but I believe there's still things will take time, or particularly in developing part of the world, we need more large validation studies before we implement for the clinical practice. So mm -hmm. it is just uh, the start of journey. I cannot say where it will end and we have been, we will switch to for, uh, for clinical practice. So, but what would be the path? Like who is initiating this? Is it uh, like, uh, can the private hospital initiate it? Is there an agency similar to the FDA uh, in the U.S. where you file um, some tools? Or, in or, Pakistan, or... we have a regulatory authority it's known as DRAP, Drug mm -hmm. Regulatory Authority. So it basically passed the rules. But before go applying the AI, what I personally believe, we need to be digitized first. We need to digitize our lab, not the entire lab. Start from mm -hmm. the big cities and then we place a small scanner in the in the remote areas so that, uh, you know, I see my friends sitting in the big city and they are giving consultation to a person who is uh, sitting in a remote area, CBC report, a, a blood report, peripheral field report through microscope cameras. You know, initially, I, I, I personally believe we don't need to jump to, the, to apply AI in clinical practice. We first need to resolve our pre-existing issues, which is the reduce number of pathologists in developing part of the world. As we don't need to have big scanners or high-tech scanners. Initially, we need to have small scanners, which we can use it for telepathologies. Mm -hmm. Once the, this issue is a big issue. Once this issue is resolved and we started learning how to use the digital images, then we can apply the AI as well. So it's a step-by-step -step process. We cannot jump altogether on AI tools, but we need to learn it, obviously. So you say telepathology is the priority and the number of pathologists in Pakistan that will come into training is higher priority. So 
Regarding the pathologist education, how does that work in Pakistan? And what resources do you have available? Do you have you any do, plan how to encourage yeah. more people basically, to become pathologists? Uh, basically... Yeah, basically there is a regularity uh, institution for postgraduate education in Pakistan. It's known as College of Physician and Surgeon Pakistan, CPSP, and it gives fellowship uh, 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 awards to the pathologists who pass the exam. Uh, I myself did a fellowship exam. Well, I myself did the training and then passed the fellowship exam. There is a systematic way through which the candidate passed through the exam. But obviously, digital tools are still not very commonly used uh, in our pa- in our part of the world, or particularly in Pakistan. But now people are aware of it. They mm-hmm. want to implement. They want to use it. But uh, most uh, of the time, the prices of scanners are still beyond the budget of many low resource organizations. So financial constraint is biggest hurdle. Mm-hmm. So I believe the role of technology vendor is crucial. Okay. Is there anything? That- you use with your smartphone or any way that you guys are doing telepathology with a smartphone? Yeah, we we use the camera connected microscope. Mm-hmm. I, I really enjoy it. I used to make the whole movie of the image and I send it to my friend to take a second opinion. And I use it basically mainly for education, uh, both undergraduates and postgraduate students. And also, I love to apply AI on it. I am a passionate learner of digital and computational pathology. So it's my passion and I used to do lots of computational pathology. I used to do lots of annotation and I learned, uh, try to learn how to annotate uh, from Iphoria and other people as well. So I basically use uh, the images for computational pathology. But you're saying that most of your colleagues don't. They only use it for telepathology. Yeah. Mm-hmm. They, they are too much overburdened. and they don't have time, actually. Pathologists are reduced in number, as I told you earlier. Yeah, I mean, you have 500 pathologists for your country. I have 500 pathologists in Poland, which is a country of um, 35 million people. Let yeah, me just I, check. yeah, it's a small country of Europe. So I have the same, and uh, actually now the official number for 2021 is 37.7 million people. Okay. Um, compared to Pakistan, exactly Pakistan, uh, which is two hundred thirty-one point four million, and we have the same number of pathologists. And I thought uh, yeah. that we have a few pathologists. Yeah, you guys have less. I mean, we have the same number, but uh, you have a lot more population to serve with yeah. uh, your pathology services. So I think this is, you know, everybody hears that. And it stays at the level of of a slogan or of a like nice thing to say. We have to help or we have to implement things in lower resource countries. But unless you realize what is the scale of this yeah. problem, and you know, to me, this is a personal connection. I'm from Poland, and I thought we have a few pathologists. And you tell me where you have a country that the big population in the world that yeah. has the same. Um, number of pathologists so the situation may be great in more in, in, uh, in some african countries maybe yes maybe we would have to i would have to invite or in countries who are war affected the situation can be more grave let me tell you the the experience that i had in ethiopia and like you say you have to go approach the problem stepwise and you're from there you're working there so you know like what this what steps should be taken the experience i had or the thing I saw in Ethiopia, it was in Addis Ababa, there was um, some international grant, I think a European grant that equipped the whole lab with uh, the newest molecular techniques. I think it was different things, but one of them were um, PCR cyclers. And this whole lab was Mm -hmm. fantastically equipped. They had a person who graduated from a PhD program in Germany. And this whole lab was under those anti-dust covers because the hospital was not able uh, to purchase the reagents to use those machines. So basically, like a lot of money and a lot of equipment just collecting dust because there were no resources to actually use this equipment, which canners, I was thinking about that. Okay, what would be the um, restriction, the bottleneck there? Maybe internet connection? 
um, maybe some kind of storage. Technology glitches. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Technology storage. glitches. We need to train technical stuff. So that's why I always emphasize that we need to start with on, on a small scale first. Make the things mature and then implement on, on the larger scale. So mm -hmm. We don't need to jump on the higher scale first. We cannot handle it. So start small steps and then start your journey. Definitely, definitely. And, you know, to know the steps, you need to know both sides of the of the story. Yeah. Insider knowledge of a person working there and also the knowledge of, okay, what's out there? What is this AI? How can you implement? Where would it fit? Which is what you basically are kind of doing in your uh, research time, or I don't want to say spare time, but it's not the time yeah, when you're I'm basically actually... a researcher, actually. Yeah, I'm right. So, now so... a researcher. I've switched my field from clinical pathology to computational pathology. I am a research a researcher now. Amazing, amazing. And so, when you visited uh, US, was was this your first time in the US? Yeah, it was my first visit. How was your trip? I mean, you went to the conference, so obviously you experienced the conference. Did you do anything yeah. else? What were your impressions? What What did you uh, get to see, visit, and learn? And just tell me. How did you feel of, after that trip? Yeah, my experience was amazing. I unfortunately lived there for the conference days only, and then I left to my country. Mm -hmm. But uh, I, I wrote a blog as well. After coming back to Pakistan, I, I wrote it that uh, Path Vision 2022 from the lens of a computational pathologist passionate. I'm going to find the blog and link in the description as well. I think it's fascinating. Like, you know, there is, let's say, Let's call it in the U.S. The, the research and development is pretty advanced. And then yeah. people learn about it and they take it to the places where they are and they like take bits and pieces and kind of it grows like a, like a network, like, you know, with little branches outside of this hub where, where this whole thing is happening. And like in, in your case, you know, a lot of work on static images, which here, yeah. like when you talk about static images, oh, it's really actually a thing of the past. Now it's whole slide images and not necessarily because there are applications of everything. And I love how it's how it's spreading. It's spreading with people who want to spread it like you who are passionate about things that, you know, you might not see it immediately being implemented everywhere in your country. Uh, but it doesn't stop you from digging deeper, checking it out, trying it on the things that you can try it on. So this is amazing. Thank you so Thank much you. for your work. Thank you. I'm going to link to every um, thing we mentioned to all the publications and the blog posts in the show notes. Um, I went through this through before our episode and it was really fascinating. And thank you so much for joining me. Thank you very much. Uh same here and uh, I'm, I'm grateful to you that you invited me and I, I got the opportunity to share my views and discuss the issues related to delayed adoption of digital pathology in our part of the world and how these novel tools actually can help to resolve many of our pre-existing issues. So thank you very much for giving me the opportunity. It was nice meeting you. Thank you. Amazing meeting you and have a great day. Thank you so much for staying till the end. This episode was special to me because it is about increasing access to pathology and not only to pathology as medical discipline, but the cutting edge aspects of pathology, AI image analysis, increasing and distributing access to those technologies in places where this was not possible so far because of the economic limitations. So you staying till the end means that this is important to you. So if you'd like to spread digital pathology knowledge even further, I would love you to share the digital version of the digital pathology one-on-one. -on -one. This version can be bought on Amazon, but the digital PDF is free and you can share it with anyone who want. If you're up for giving me a gift for this Christmas, sharing this gift that I give to you would be a wonderful one. And I talk to you in the next episode.